if you're watching an animal developing, you start seeing, uh, we'll, t we'll have a development lecture at the very end of uh, the introduction to the neuroanatomy and neurophysiology. Um, but you'll see that there is sort of a prototypical brain that develops. And it has sort of big different bulbs on it, which you'll see common from fly all the way up to human uh, fish. And, and you can sort of break it up into three different regions, the telencephalon, diencephalon, which produces most of the um, cerebrum, and then the mesencephalon, which is the midbrain, which produces a lot of the, I think, that's where we're looking at the uh, inferior colliculus and you know, right around that fourth ventricle. I don't think he mentioned the colliculus. but uh, And then the rhombencephalon, which is the hindbrain, which is the, the medulla, and then onto the spinal cord. So here's, we divide the brain up into sort of different sort of geographic regions. Uh, so we talked about the cerebellum down here, the cerebellum being this one sort of thing that hangs off, so involved in the motor commands and sort of smoothing out motor commands. And then the cerebellum is broken up into the temporal lobe, the occipital lobe, the parietal lobe, and then the frontal lobe. And then there's actually an area underneath, which is the insula, um, which is down here. We'll see that on, on the next one. So here are the couple major sulci. So sulci meaning uh, the, the involutions of the brain, and gyri meaning the, the bumps. It's really hard when you take a human brain. You know, in the textbooks, they, they are always nice like this. There's... Uh, some very nice anatomical marks you can find, but when you go from human brain to human brain, you'll find it's actually hard to find some of these, uh, these things. But the most obvious are what's called the central sulcus, which is this big line right here. And then the lateral sulcus, which is what separates the temporal lobe from the frontal lobe. So there's the central sulcus, there's the lateral sulcus, um, and then in front of the central sulcus is the precentral gyrus. And just following anterior, posterior is the postcentral gyrus. And we'll find that those actually have very uh, interesting purposes. And then you have the occipital gyrus, which is down here on the occipital lobe. Uh, and we're not going to go into any details on any other gyri and sulci. A lot of them are named and have specific, uh, are, you know, involved in uh, speech like Broca's and the angular gyrus and things like that. If you, if you go, if you cut across the brain and look in, across the cerebellum, the, most of the cerebellum in mammals is layers, has six layers in it. And so layer one near the pia layer uh, is, is, well, layer one's the P, next to the PL layer, and then layer six is the deepest layer. And below the deepest layer, you have the white matter, which is all the nerves which are going to projecting to different areas. Usually, a lot of times, going across uh, to the contralateral side or to other cortical areas within the brain. Whereas the superficial layer also is, has a lot of white matter and connections, but it's usually collect, connecting to more local areas. And then those, those white matter layers uh, down here are then usually projecting and landing into layer four. So layer four is usually where you get a lot of inputs. And layer five and six are the processing of the information that go out to other cortical areas, and layer two and three are for more processing of what's go to more local uh, cortical areas. And that, that's a very gross simplification and generalization, but um, is, is you know, useful when you're learning about this. And then in each of these layers, there are different cells. And those cells have dendrites and axons that go around. And those dendrites can often project through a lot of the layers. And somebody about 100 years ago went through and actually sliced up the brain very finely and looked at the different layers and found that uh, the thicknesses of these layers varied from, from area to area. Uh, 
Broadman is the guy who went through and, and labeled every single area. So he actually um, found that each one of these areas had a different layering in it. And that was just done by anatomy. And then later on, it was found that many of these areas are actually very distinct in what they do. And they've actually, now we continue to use the Broadman areas to describe things, but we will talk about Broadman area 17 as now what's called, does anybody know what Broadman area 17 is? That's right, it's the primary visual cortex. That's right. Um, area 41, does anyone know what area 41 is? Auditory, yes, that's the primary auditory cortex. Does anybody know what uh, area four is? It's not fair to do this. I'm asking you things I'm supposed to be teaching you, but I know a lot of you know these things. Smoker, yeah. yeah, so it's actually, that's right. I, I have troubles with that too, but it's, uh, the reason why I think of that as, uh, as motor is because the, the frontal cortex is really about preparing and thinking about you know, what you're going to do and why, and you move here, and, and sort of the most basic one is actually preparing motor movements. And so actually all the neurons in here uh, can be very much directly related to actually planning of a, a movement of a very basic uh, muscle group that actually moves an arm forward or backwards. And then the opposite, uh, these layers three, one, and two, wh what are those? Sensory. That's right. So all those neurons which we talked about starting in that dorsal column go up through the, uh, well, we'll go through that pathway, but through the uh, medial lumniscus and then up through the thalamus, VPL, and up into this sensory cortex here. And then there are some interesting ones which are to do with, um, so here's the brain actually divided by function. Um, and so we have motor areas. Um, so this is the primary motor cortex is this area here. So we area four, primary motor cortex. And then the supplementary, supplementary motor cortex are the areas right next to it, which are also involved in preparation. But you stimulate there and you get more complex behaviors. It's not just a simple, you stimulate there and your arm moves. It's actually never that simple. <laughs> just a, you can't just put in electrodes there that makes somebody walk. I mean, that, that's something we would like to do. But uh, and the premotor areas, and it has a lot to do with planning of motor activity. And then you have your sensory areas. This somatosensory uh, for here, and then you have the visual cortex. So. Uh, when we talk about the visual system, you'll see there's actually a direct projection. You can almost take what the world you see out here and actually almost looks like a direct projection. It goes through some, some warping, but it projects onto that visual cortex. So you could almost plug in an electrode right here and you stimulate and you would see a, a bright spot in visual space out here. And you can, uh, the way that was mapped out was people actually put radioactive glucose in through the eyes and then gave them a test, animals a test pattern, and you could see that test pattern actually show up on the, the visual cortex. And then the auditory cortex, you go and stimulate in here, and you actually hear sounds. Uh, and, and then down here, so if you actually pull back the uh, lateral sulcus, uh, there's actually another cortex sort of that's been folded under, and that's the gustatory cortex. And that's actually where if you stimulate somebody, will, it'll feel like they'll, they're tasting something. And then you have more complex areas, which are association areas, which is non-primary uh, sensory areas. So if you stimulate there, you don't get a um, something which you can relate to either a movement or a sense, but more... Uh, planning and things like that. So parietal cortex, posterior parietal, the prefrontal cortex, infrotemporal, that's this area here. These are all associational areas. 